so we're, we're going through the I am statements of Jesus. Why are we going through that? Because I felt the Lord say, we have got to get back to the basics. Who am I? Who am I? Have I captivated the very hearts of those who are coming to Full Life Church? Am I the king in their hearts? Am I the Lord on their throne? Who am I? Am I just a man who you just say I am? Jesus is just, is, am I a prophet? Am I just a man? Or am I king of kings, Lord of lords? And I said, okay, I'll, I'll preach the I am statements, Jesus, not knowing what I'm getting my own self into. Because as a preacher, I got to apply this just as much as you guys do. So we're going through the I am statements, right? And we did last week the bread of life. And I just want to, again, applaud you guys. I got numerous texts from people saying that they went home and read about the bread of life. Good job. I, I will clap for you guys. That's awesome. We want to be a church that's in his word, not just hearing the word. I'll say that again. We want to be a church that's in his word, meaning you guys are in this thing Monday through Sunday because this will change your life because the Holy Spirit will come in through this. Your life won't be changed by coming to Sunday mornings at 10.30 a.m. just hearing me preach. So thank you for going home and reading. And I want to encourage you guys to keep, keep reading the I am statements. This one, I am the light of the world, you'll find in John 8. John 8, and so if you have your Bible, you can open that up to John 8. And I just want to start off by saying, most Bibles will say that this is not in the earliest manuscript. So this is what I'm saying. If you want to come talk to me, come talk to me. We'll have a glass of coffee, or a cup of coffee. You don't have coffee and glasses. I'm learning this. We'll have a cup of coffee, and we'll talk about the earliest manuscripts. Because here's what most scholars believe, is that this story, this account in the gospel, John actually took place. It's a matter of when and where. When did it happen and where do we place it? And so the earliest manuscripts say they don't have it. I want to tell you guys right now, that does not negate the validity of Scripture. Even though it says right here, the earliest manuscripts do not include. It doesn't, it doesn't negate the validity of Scripture. It doesn't add to the Scriptures. It doesn't take away the Scriptures. It doesn't mean that the Scriptures aren't true. And this is where we're going to find ourselves with this beautiful story where Jesus claims an I am statement. And I just want to catch you guys up for those who may not be here. Maybe you guys don't know who Jesus is. But the I am statements is the very reason that Jesus was crucified. And I can do this in a sermon series. There is ample proof that Jesus, even if you want to say he's just a person, I'll agree with, he, yeah, he was a person. Because historians say that they saw him walk the earth. Historians, the greatest historians say that he was a man who had a small gathering of 12 disciples. That he was a man that was crucified. It's all there in history. Where you start to get sidetracked is, did he really rise from the grave? And we as believers, obviously, we believe he did. And I got to tell you, there's ample proof of that also. So if you're here to maybe... Test the waters of who God is, came to a great spot. Because he's going to meet you. He's going to meet you. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this body of believers. Lord God, as, we, as I looked out in the congregation, Lord God, there are seasoned people who have been walking with you faithfully for many, many years, Lord God. And there's people who may have just put their faith in you, Lord God. But I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are a God that no matter if we gave our faith to you yesterday or we placed our faith in you 40-some years ago, Lord, you are a God who continuously moves us forward. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray in this very moment that you speak through me the words that you want spoken. And Lord, I pray that you meet the people where they're at. Father God, I pray that every person in here would take one step forward to see and know that you are God, that you are I am. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we'll find ourselves in John 8 here. I'm just going to read it for you. It says, they went each to his own house. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came to the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. And I just want to kind of bring this passage to life because Jesus at this point was man to a lot of people. He was potentially being a prophet. I mean before this 
this took place right here in, in chapter 7. You go through it and they're saying, man, who is this man? Is he the son of David or is he not? They're, they're confused. But here's a man who's teaching and we see right here that it says all the people came to him and they sat down and he taught them. I mean, think about this. I think about Billy Graham, the great Billy Graham, the great evangelist who would go and preach the living word of God. And people would come and they'd want to hear them and they'd want to hear Billy Graham preach and, and teach the word of God. And I think about Jesus, a man where they're like, he has no formal education. I went to Bible school. This Jesus, at a young age, was teaching the religious. And people, he was teaching with so much authority that people were gathering because they could not get enough of him. And they say that he came and, and everyone came and, and, and he taught them. And then it says, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst. They said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery. And I want to tell you guys over and over, the accounts of the scriptures is all about Jesus versus the Pharisees and Sadducees. It's, it's Jesus versus the, the religious and, the, and, and the, the religious people, the very people who thought they had everything together were bringing this woman to him, right? And they're, they're placing this woman before Jesus. But they didn't know who Jesus was. They're always trying to catch Jesus so that they can show that he wasn't who he was starting to claim to be. And they say, now in the law of Moses, now, no, now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. So Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. The religious leaders here in this passage, they could care less about truth. They could care less about what Jesus was going to say. They brought this woman specifically to try to catch him. They brought this woman to test the very God that we serve. They didn't care about truth. They just cared about catching Jesus. See, religion will never lead to revelation. Religion will never lead to revelation because they were blinded by their own goodness. They were blinded by their own pursuit, by their own deeds, by their own thoughts and thinking. How many times do we come to God wanting an answer, but we come with our preconceived thoughts? Where, where we might come to Jesus and we, we seek him in prayer, but it's just like, I already have this thought process of salvation. I have this thought process about speaking in tongues. I have this thought process about spiritual gifts. I have this thought process about eschatology, whatever you want to bring. We come to the Lord with this preconceived knowledge. And we can block the very words, the very thing that Jesus is trying to teach us. We can block it. And I'm not saying that we're religious people in here. I'm saying religion will never lead to revelation because when we come with preconceived knowledge, preconceived thoughts, we, we block the Holy Spirit from moving in our hearts. And that is what's taking place right away right here. The Pharisees and the scribes, the very people who wrote the word, brought this woman. They, they could care less what Jesus was going to say. They had already thought in their mind about the law of Moses. And we see Jesus, this is great. Jesus says, he, or it says he bent down and he wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw the stone at her. And once again, Jesus bent down and wrote on the ground. Okay, most scholars say there's three things that happened when Jesus was bending over right on the ground. Number one, Jesus was most likely writing the Ten Commandments on the sand. Pharisees, scribes, they knew the, they knew the law. They mentioned the law. So most likely, most scholars, well, some scholars believe that Jesus bent over in front of everyone that brought this woman and wrote the Ten Commandments right before them. That's one position. The other position is that some believe that Jesus wrote down and said, man, you're bringing this woman who's stuck in sin. Let me call out your own sin. So some, believe, some scholars believe that Jesus began to write every sin for every person that came with that woman. How about that? How about that for revelation? You come forward with a woman that you like to catch in adultery and it's like, man, she's a horrible person. Let's show her. Let's, let's embarrass her, right? And, and then you just come before God and he's like, here, let me show you your sin. Oof. That'll show something, right? Or some people believe that Jesus was just fed up at this point and just was doodling on the ground. Those are the three things, like, almost like, where, man, you're just wasting my time. I'm just going to scribble around here, right? Those are the three positions. Ten commandments, 
right in people's sin, or he was just, he knew where they were going. Okay? So he's right on the ground. Verse 9 says, but when they heard, they went away one by one. Beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. And Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, <laughs> woman, where are they? <laughs> uh, my wife would not like if I talked that way. Has no one commanded you, or has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go from now on and sin no more. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, what? I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have light of life. Praise the Lord. I just want to clarify the woman's part. In, in this passage, woman, when he's saying this, it, it is not a sign of disrespect. It's actually a sign of respecting her. Grace and mercy, that's what Jesus is all about. And he wants to meet you here today with his grace, mercy, and love. I love this passage. I love this passage. It's a beautiful story of where we could have all been. Maybe not in adultery, but broken people, amen. And I love this passage because I'm going to set it up in context for you. Because right before this had taken place, Jesus was participating in the, in the Feast of Booths. Or the Feast of Tabernacle. And what that was, is it was associated with the Old Testament. And they would gather during this feast and they would, they would partake in the harvest of the grapes and olives. Not the grain, the grapes and olives. And it would be a week-long feast that they would come to. So it's similar to like John C. Fremont days, right? But we don't do the, the grapes and olives. But it's just a, a gathering. And they're remembering. And it took place most likely in September and October. And it always involved the people in the rural areas. And what they would do is they built makeshift structures of light branches and leaves. And they placed them on these booths and they lived there for a week. In total remembrance of who God was in the Old Testament. How he led them out of the wilderness. Oftentimes they would draw water and they would light lamps during this feast. Because it's remembering when they struck the rock and water flew, flew from it, right? And they're remembering that God in Exodus was a cloud by day and a fire by night leading them out. And that's what they're partaking in, in this part. And Jesus, this is beautiful because Jesus is saying this statement right in the women of courts. Or the court of women. So he's at the temple. But he couldn't go to where the priests were to preach. So he would stand in the, the court of women, which is an open area. And it's, it's next to the treasury where we know the treasury. You take money, right? But here's the thing about the temple and the, the women, of course. They have four massive pillars. And during this fe feast, they would send uh, younger priests to climb the ladder. Right? Earn your stripes, young guys. Climb the ladders. And they're, they're climbing the ladders and they light four lamps at the top that would shine over the whole temple and, and outside of it. Just bring light. And Jesus is standing right next to this saying, I am the light of the world. Instantly, they knew what he was claiming. He's, claim, he's claiming God. Because he's associating with the lights that they had just lit in. I am the light of the world. Man. That's awesome. Jesus is just throwing everything into chaos. Right? Here's the thing that we get from Jesus as the light of the world is Jesus, the light of the world, illuminates our need for a savior. Jesus, God himself, illuminates our need for a savior. We have two different peoples in this account. We have two different people in this account. We have number one. We have the, the, the Pharisees and the scribes, right? And then number two, we have the woman, right? And so the woman, she's, she's representing sinners. She is broken. She's humiliated, right? She is fearful. She's wounded. And most likely, she's embarrassed. Why would she be embarrassed, Pastor JJ? Glad you guys asked. Let me take you to the scriptures. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been what? Caught in adultery. See, back then, if you caught someone, there was no time to say, put your clothes on. They might have thrown something at her to cover herself. Caught in adultery, they instantly grab her and bring her embarrassment. This woman is totally publicly humiliated and as we all know when you struggle with sin right you have that own sense of guilt and shame 
for yourself, amen? That's what, that's what happens. So you have her on the, on the left side, and then you have the Pharisees and the scribes on the right side representing what? Self-righteousness. Legalism. Religion. Right? They were religious, prideful people. They saw their salvation in their goodness. And they found their obedience in the law. So they say, doesn't Moses command us to do this? So they're referencing, this is the test. They're referencing back to the Old Testament law. So for those of you who don't know, this is being pulled from Leviticus and Deuteronomy. You can write these scriptures down. Leviticus 20. Leviticus 20 and Deuteronomy 22. Go home, read those. But in those verses, you would see that in the law, it specifically says, if you catch a woman in adultery, you are to bring both the woman and the man. Well, we don't see the man here. We don't, they didn't bring the man, they brought the woman. Because they didn't care what Jesus was about. They just wanted to catch him. They're pretty much saying, hey, if you agree with the law, Jesus, then you're coming against your own very word. Jesus, if you say to stone her, you're coming against your own very word because you said it has to be man and woman brought to you. On the other hand, on the other side, if Jesus were to say, go ahead and throw those stones at her, he's committing, uh, he's, he's pretty much breaking the law. Because in the Roman Empire, the, only the Romans could kill people. So Jesus is here. I mean, think about this. They're pretty much saying, hey, stone, if you say stone, you're coming against the Roman Empire. But if, you're, if you say no, then you're, you're coming against your word. And that's why myself, personally, I believe that Jesus could care less what they're doing. He's probably just doodling in the sand. Like, I know where you guys are going with this, and I'm about to show you where I'm going to go with this. Right? Here's the thing. This woman in this passage, I honestly believe with all my heart, she believed that there was no way out. There was no way out for her. None. You're caught in adultery. They maybe throw some clothes at you. They grab you by the arms and they're taking you to this man who claims to be God himself. The very God who wrote and gave Moses the Old Testament law that, that claims to be uh, for you to, to lose your life. That claims that you will be stoned at this moment. She believed that she had no way out. She was caught red-handed. I can only imagine her thoughts standing there before Jesus himself before the Pharisees and the scribes, the religious people, before everyone else that he was teaching in this area. I can only think about the shame she felt. Can you, can you imagine that? It's almost like today where you'll be brought to court for maybe murdering someone or, or doing something really bad in our law of the land. And everyone's lined up and, and the judge would be bringing you up or, or maybe their lawyer, someone, whoever it is, cops, whatever. They bring you up before the judge and you're waiting for your conviction right there in front of everyone. Can you imagine the intense pain and humiliation you'd be feeling from there? And this is what we read in verse 10 and 11 when they brought her to Jesus expecting him to do something. This is what Jesus said. Jesus stood up and said to them, uh, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. See, we have two different peoples here. We have a group of people, the self-righteous, prideful, religious people that left in shame. They came prideful and they left shameful. Because they could care less about their salvation. They wanted to catch Jesus. So they came all ready to go and they left defeated. And you see a woman who's brought, humiliated, and, and full of shame and guilt and everything, and she leaves in joy. Religious and prideful people who thought they had everything together leaves humiliated. It says, one by one, as they heard it, they left, beginning with the older ones. 
the ones who knew everything were the ones who said, man, I have no grounds. I'm walking away. And the woman herself who's been caught in this adultery and the sin and the very thing that should have cost her her life, Jesus says, I don't condemn you. She saw the goodness of God. That is an amen. Thank you, Roger. She saw the goodness of God. I wonder about us in this room. Honestly, I do. So many of us come to God with a wrong frame of mind. We come to God because, and, and we believe that he's going to punish us for our sins. We come to God because uh, we, we think that he's going to demean us because of our thoughts. Or, or we maybe uh, come to God and, and think that he's going to judge us in our current state. But what Jesus showed this woman was that he was the light of the world. Was that he as God came not to condemn, but to save the world. And that's what we read in verses 10 and 11. Jesus stands up and says, I do not condemn you. How about read John 3.16. If you guys have your Bibles, go to John 3.16-17. through 17. John 3.16, we love that verse, right? Well, woo, for God so loved the world, amen, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his, his, his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Check 17. For God did not send his son into the world to what? What? Yeah, God did not send him into the world to condemn, but in order that the world might be what? Saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And it goes on to talk about, um, and this is the judgment. This is the judgment that light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than the light. Jesus Christ himself did not come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. And believers, I got to tell us. Man, when we come before God, he's not a God that's going to whip you. He's not a God that's going to put you down. He's not a God that's going to push you to the side. He's going to love you. He's going to embrace you. He's going to show you grace. He's going to show you mercy. And as we as believers would catch this, that when we are stuck in our sin, that we can run to the Father and not away from the Father, you will find peace. You will find joy. You will find salvation. You will find refreshment. He will meet you where you're at. That is Jesus Christ, the Lamb who was slain, the word condemned here in Greek is krino, and it literally means to pronounce guilt and, a, and give a sentence to someone. And it literally means to pass judgment. Our judgment day as believers is before the sovereign king when we go home. That is your judgment time. I'm not saying that God doesn't discipline. I'm not saying that God just gives you everything you want. That's not the God that we serve. He will discipline, but it is in a loving action. When my daughter does me wrong, which is more often than not at her age, it's not like I go up and just knock her lights out. No, I get down on her face. I explain to her what she did. I love her, but then I say I have to discipline her. And honestly, it hurts me more than her. That's the God we serve. That is Jesus Christ, the Lamb who was slain. I just got to wonder, guys. Remember, this word condemn literally means to pass judgment. And Jesus says over and over and over in the scriptures, I have not come to condemn. I have not come to judge at this moment. I came to, to give life and to give it abundantly. And I have to wonder, for us as a church, what could happen in all of our lives with, with God himself? What could happen if we knew that God, the one true God, that he is a God of love? That God is love. He, it's just not something that he has. It's he is love. I wonder what would happen if we understood that God is mercy, that he is hope. That he has restoration for us in store. I believe that we as individuals will see our prayer lives changed. I believe that we as individuals will see our scripture reading change. I believe that we would see our self-righteous acts fall off the wayside. I believe that we as individuals will see a desire to serve the lost, to serve our community, and to serve one another in our church. I believe that we would begin to walk in the fullness of Jesus 
Christ because that's what the Holy Spirit enables us. I believe because Jesus Christ illuminates our need for a Savior that when we respond to him and place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that we have fullness, that we have life, that we have a new way of thinking, that we are drawn to him, that we love him. That's what happens when we realize that God is love. And yes, do not get me wrong, this is another sermon. We will talk about the judgment seat of Christ because there is one day that we will all stand before him and be judged. But right now, God loved us so much that he sent his one and only son that we can be saved through him. Through him. Man, that's good. That's good news. Read with me Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Because as we respond to the need of a savior, we become the light of the world. We become the light of the world. And John, or sorry, and Ma did I say John? If so, I meant Matthew. <laughs> read, go to Matthew 5, 14 through 16, because this is where we read it. This is the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus preaching a better sermon than any of us could do. Talk about comparison. Thanks, good Lord. Like, <laughs> Jesus preaching the Sermon on the Mount. It goes to the Beatitudes. He talks about salt and light. And here we find in verse 14 through 16, read with this with me. You are the what? Light of the what? Let's say that again. You are the what? Yes, of the? Yes. A city on a hill cannot be what? Hidden. Well, come on. We cannot be what? Hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but, we, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see the good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. That's a good passage because when we come to know Jesus, we are the light of the world. And it literally makes me, when I read this passage, man, I grew up uh, north of Fremont and I went to Logan View High School and I loved Friday evenings. I love Friday evenings. I love autumn Friday evenings, especially when I was a kid. Because when I was a kid, when I was growing up, we would go to Logan View and my brother would be playing football. And I adored my brother. He was an awesome athlete played quarterback, right, and, and it was so fun because when we go to the home games, he would let me wear his away pants, which would really just be like just drooping on me. But then when we go to away games, he would let me wear his home pants, and so I'd be able to wear some of his outfit, and, and going to Logan View was just an awesome experience. If you guys haven't been to a Logan View football game, I encourage you to go up there because it honestly is nothing, there's nothing like it. Man, when it, where, where Logan View sits all by itself and there's cornfields around that surround it. And, and when you get there as a little kid, it, it sits on a hill. And I remember as a kid, you, you'd have the game to your right and then you have all of us over here playing football by ourselves. And in the back uh, of playing football, you'd start to smell that fresh popcorn with a lot of butter on it and a lot of salt. And as a kid, you're like, man, now I'm hungry. It's halftime. And when they went through halftime, we would do halftime. We'd go get some, some, some popcorn and pop. And we come out and play some football again. And at the end of the game, they have a huge hill that you just roll down over and over and over. And you get stuck full of sandburrs, right, Sheldon? Sheldon knows because you went to Logan View, amen? Yeah, there's nothing like it, right? Here, the greatest thing about Logan View is this. It's surrounded, I'm kidding not, it's surrounded by a cornfield. But this is the greatest thing. You start to see the stadium of Logan View from afar. Because it stands by itself on a hill with the football lights shining down. And I'll never forget every Friday that we drove up there, we would just be coming on that. Then it was a two lane, now it's the four lane. And you can kind of get up on the hill and you start to see the light. And as you go closer and closer to the field, it got brighter and brighter. And just as I could see the lights on the football field, the very people we come in contact in our daily lives should see the light of Christ in us and through us. It should make a difference. It should make a difference where we are walking. See, the word basket in these verses is called modios. Modios. And it's literally like this. It's just a basket. It's a brown basket. Weaving basket. But what they would use it for is they would measure grain with it. So they'd put a lot of grain and they'd shake it. And they'd shake out all the, all the amount to where they had it. And what Jesus is saying is this. He's talking to his disciples and he's saying, it makes no sense 
to light a lamp for people who are coming over to have very dinner that you're wanting to eat with them. It makes no sense to light the lamp, the only thing that you have to, to shine a light in your house, to light that and put it under a basket. It makes no sense. You can't see anything different. You can't talk to anyone. You can't fellowship. And, and there's nothing good that comes of it. And he's telling his disciples, why would you do that? He's telling them that when people came to your house, the whole point of fellowship in the, in the Bible and Jesus, when he calls us to, to follow him, the whole point of living our life with the non-believers is so that they see the light of Jesus Christ. So Jesus, now being with his disciples for a period of time, he's saying to them at this moment, hey, you're seeing the light. In Matthew 5, he's saying, you're seeing the light. You're, you're seeing my fruit. I'm, I'm, I'm calling you to live a different lifestyle. I'm calling you to leave everything. I'm calling you to follow me. And the whole purpose of you following me and the whole purpose of you to, to leave that lifestyle, the whole purpose for you to love me is so that the very people you interact with will know that I am God and that I am good. That's what Jesus is saying to them. And I wonder what Jesus could do with us in this, in this house of worship this morning if we could understand that as we as believers are actually not part of this world. That we as believers are no longer a part of this world. That Jesus has set us free from the darkness in this world and because of that freedom, we are called to let our light shine, which is him in us. That we are to not participate in wicked jokes. That we are not to participate in the, the name calling. That we are to not participate in anything of this world that does not bring glory to the Father. And we see a lot of that nowadays in the news, don't we? And I wonder as believers of Christ, not just at Full Life, but in America today, as much as we pray for revival, I wonder if God's just waiting for us to honestly just surrender everything and not get involved in everything else. To know that our light in us, Him, Jesus, through us, through the Holy Spirit, is more important to share that than our thoughts on Black Lives Matter. To share the light of Jesus Christ more than we talk about Donald Trump. To share the light of Jesus Christ more than we talk about being a Republican. To share the good news of Jesus Christ more than we talk about being a Democrat. As your leader, I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge all of us. Because our mission in this world is not to be part of the world, it's to be separated from the world and to let God's light shine through us. And I promise you, I encounter them daily. That when we ask someone, can we pray for you? That you're going to see the Holy Spirit move in your life because there are broken people everywhere you go and Jesus is telling his disciples this is the very reason you follow me not to condemn the lost not to judge the lost not to blast the lost not to catch them in their sin but to love them and to not condemn them to embrace them and to not judge them to lift them up and speak grace and truth which is what Jesus was grace and truth. See, the woman in this account, when he says, woman, neither do I condemn you. Right? I'm going to go back to that passage. He says, woman, neither, uh, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. I don't pass judgment. Right now, I'm extending you grace, mercy, and love. Like, you study this passage, and that's what he's doing. He's extending grace, mercy, and love at this point. But then check this out. Then he says, from now on, sin no more. Grace, mercy, love will always catch the, catch the attention of the unbeliever. Righteousness will always push the unbeliever away. Grace, mercy, and love will always catch the attention of the unbeliever. Righteousness, religion, pride will always push them away. When we come to Jesus and he changes our life, it enables us to be the light of the world. John 8, 12. John 8, 12. 
Read this with me. I am the light of the world. And Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Way back in Genesis, this is, man, when I was studying this, my mind was, was fried. Like, you can't comprehend light. You, you can't. Light illuminates. It, it, it shines stuff down, and, and God is light, right? And we see in Genesis 1 that God created the heavens and the earth. It goes back to that. And in Genesis 1, 2, we would read that the Spirit of God was hovering over the world. That's what we see, and it was, it was it, there's no void, and, and a lot of people say it was just chaotic because in darkness there's nothing but chaos. And we see that the Spirit of God was over the world, and he produces light to separate the darkness from light. And what does Jesus say, or God? He says, what? He saw that it was good. Here's the thing about darkness. Darkness stands for distress. Literally, it stands for distress, anxiety, and confusion. And darkness is the absence of light. Darkness is the absence of light. So you guys can hear my voice right now. You have no idea where I'm at. And I have no idea where I'm at. Because darkness is the absence of light. And I thought this would be a great illustration. But now I'm second guessing myself. <laughs> no. It's good. It's good. Darkness is the absence of light. Nothing good comes in darkness. Nothing. So what is Jesus saying? What is Jesus saying? I mean, Jesus is saying that there's some of you, there are some of you guys that are stuck in darkness still. There are some of you guys in here who, who know Jesus and you can hear his voice but you're producing no light because you're stuck in the very things of this world. And you're lost and you have anxiety and right now this darkness may be causing some of you some anxiety because you don't know what's going to happen. But as the leader who prepared this message, I know what's going to happen in a few moments. So I have no anxiety. But here's the thing about Full Life Church. We have been declared a church set on a hill. We have been declared of a church where God is going to do the miraculous, that the lost will be saved. And I'm telling you right now that in order to have that happen, in order for Jesus Christ himself to produce what he wants to do, we have got to let our lights shine. When I produce light, one by one, by one, by one, the lightness cast out the darkness. Darkness is absence of light. So the question I have for you guys today, are you surrendered to Jesus where you're producing the light? Are you surrendered to Jesus where you're letting him move in you and through you to where when you go to Walmart, people see the light of Jesus Christ? To when you go to your family functions, they see Jesus Christ. Church, it's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. There are people in Fremont, Nebraska that are stuck in bondage. That are stuck in addiction. That are stuck in the very darkness that some of us fear. 
but when we let our lights shine, where we go, Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, begins to manifest himself and produces a light where people say, I need that, I want that, I want my life changed, I want my marriage changed, I want my sons and daughters changed, I need that. And you produce a fruit and you begin to produce this light and you begin to disciple them and they, they come to church and they begin to love Jesus and then they begin to spread the very light and what you begin to see is Fremont radically transformed because of the goodness of Jesus Christ. Church, it's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. I don't care about couches in the foyer. I don't care about the, the projection screen and what things we use on the screen. I don't care about what songs we sing. What I care about is Jesus being glorified and people coming to know Jesus. And I want to encourage you guys this morning. If I'm talking like I'm mad, I'm not. I'm just, I'm passionate. But if you have more of a problem about couches being moved than you do about people coming to Jesus, then you're, you have a problem. If you're more concerned about the way we put these chairs and what we do about sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, we have a problem in this church. If we have a problem about the songs that we sing rather than Jesus Christ being shown in our lives, we have a problem. Because Jesus didn't come to have us complain about the chairs and couches and songs and anything else. He came that we may be saved through him, and that through us, that people will come to know the one true king. So here's the thing that we're going to do this morning. I was supposed to walk out in the middle of here, but it unplugged. Here's the thing. Jesus, though he didn't come to condemn or judge, Scriptures say that people heard his message and say, how can we do this? How can we do this? And Jesus says, is my message offensive to you? His message is offensive. Because in the truth is we are sinners. Saved by God's grace. And this morning I might offend some people here. but it's to move you forward. If we were to turn off all of our flashlights right now, those of you who have flashlights, and I turn this off, nothing. Some of you are living your life like this. I'm in. I'm out. I'm in, I'm out. And some of you need to be awakened. Because Jesus in Revelation says that if you hear me knock, I'll come in and have fellowship with you. And that's written to believers. And so I want to open up the altars this morning. That if you are someone who needs a light to go on, to come to the light. Number one, if you haven't placed your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I want to encourage you to come forward. And what you feel right now is the enemy saying no. Don't do it. Because the enemy knows the goodness of Jesus Christ. The enemy knows who God is. The enemy knows what's going to happen. The enemy knows that when you come to Jesus Christ, your life's going to be transformed. The other thing I want to encourage you guys to do is for those of you who may be stagnant, your light's gone off. That if you want a refreshment of the Lord Jesus Christ as light, to come forward. To not sit in your seats, but to come forward and receive the refreshment 
of the Holy Spirit. If that's you, I encourage you to do it now. The very outpouring of the Holy Spirit, this is where lives are going to be changed. This is where Fremont's going to be changed. I'll give it again. If you need a refreshment of the Holy Spirit, where your light has not been shining where you've been, to come forward at this very moment and receive a refreshment. For those who are in the chairs, if you could lift your arms in agreement as we pray over those people. Father God, you are the God of all gods. Jesus, you came to be slaughtered. Jesus, you came to take our sin and put it on the cross. And because of your bloodshed, because of your broken body, we have redemption. We have victory over death. We have newness in life. We have adoption into your family as sons and daughters. And Jesus, we can't thank you enough. And Father God, Abba Father, you are a loving Father. Father, you hear them crying at this altar. Holy Spirit, this very moment, I pray in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, to come on the very people on this altar and refresh them with your spirit. Holy Spirit, that they receive a newness of life. Holy Spirit, that you come upon them and infuse your spirit and you begin to fill them from from their toes to their heads. Holy Spirit, that you bring life, that you bring joy, Holy Spirit, that you bring a newness of peace. Holy Spirit, that you bring the empowerment that only you can bring. Holy Spirit, that you redeem them in a matter of a new redemption. That you bring new revelation, Lord God. Holy Spirit, that you bring a a fruit of, of a spirit, Lord God, that produces the light that only you can do, Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord God, in this very moment that you touch them in a mighty way, Lord God. That you're bringing new waters that's flowing through them as it flows through the river, Lord God. Father God, that they lay everything down to serve you, to worship you, to glorify you, Lord God, because that's what this life is about. Father God, I pray for the refreshment that they are desiring. Lord God, that you begin and continue to move in their spirits at this very moment. 